welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. First item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Fair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have one announcement and a follow-up item. Uh, a few weeks ago, might have been a month ago, we had here at the Green Mountain Care Board a panel discussion on primary care and family practice specifically, and um, had a panel that consisted of providers as well as educators. And I want to report out that tonight at, we're having a special primary care advisory group meeting at the Green Mountain Care Board offices starting at 5 o'clock. And we'll be hearing from members of the primary care advisory group who actually had a meeting with Heisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth and the UVM Medical School, the Larner School of Medicine. And they'll be reporting out on their progress towards their goals of uh, increasing residency spots for primary care and family practice. So I'm excited to hear what they said. And I just wanted to share that progress with all of you and the public. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item in minutes of Wednesday, February 12th, is our motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 12th. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to the UVM milestone report. And Anna, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I also want to thank the Green Mountain Care Board again for the opportunity to give you an update on the status of the inpatient psychiatric capacity project. This is our seventh quarterly report. Um, I'm going to uh, skip ahead of the couple slides that we um, have here, and that these are slides that certainly the Green Mountain Care Board has seen, as well as the public, that sets the frame for what we're trying to achieve with this project and our aim statement. And we'll move to um, the supporting structure for this project. So I want to recenter us on uh, the fact that we are on the phase <coughs> two of the design and operational requirements. We have completed the facility programming. The uh, facility location um, has been identified. And we've spent um, the last few months in the schematic design refining that, um, which has given us some insight into the financial impact of the build as it's currently designed. So just to recap, in June of 2019, we um, came forward with where we were reciting the facility location on the CBMC campus. In August, the facility program was completed uh, for the inpatient psychiatric build and the emergency department. A reminder that approximately 80% of acute care psychiatric admissions are admitted through the emergency department. So we um, included the planning for emergency services as part of this build. In January, in our last report to the Green Mount Care Board, we focused on getting an update on where the facility was being sited. If you'll recall, we were not able to tear down um, Mountain View building, um, which was uh, more proximal um, to the rest of the campus um, proper. Uh, and so we had to shift where the location was sited. We also had initiated at that time a parking study and the exploration of options to enter both the new build and the whole organization that was impacted by this build. The ED programming um, resulted in a uh, recommendation for four bed transitional care unit in the ED. Currently CBMC has a three bed transitional care unit. Um, and uh, that all of that work was done with um, intense stakeholder input, um, clinical and support staff input as well as the uh, site visits and benchmarking that we had completed. Since our report in November, um, we have completed the schematic design and you're going to hear more about that update today. We have also completed the parking and traffic study and we have initiated um, a data analysis refresh. So we will give you those updates as well. Um, I think they're important and also inform the um, high level cost estimate that we now have ready to. Jim Alvarez, our VP of Support Services, will give you an update on the schematic design. And E4, our VP for Strategic and Business Planning, will provide an update on the data analysis to date. 
and where we are with the business plan development. Okay, so this first slide represents the uh, massing of the concept that we've been working on. Yeah, I'm here. Wow. Uh, so down on um, for Alma Fisher Road on the lower right hand corner, you can see that that is our existing ED. And so this concept moves the ED to the um, east side of the campus um, on the first layer, the first level, with the two floors of psych above that and then a mechanical floor on top of that, and this building then being structured for future med surge floor as part of our long-term master plan. In massing the building there, it um, we called for the relocation of what we consider our main entrance to the hospital. And so you see the light blue corridor that then takes you back to a structured parking solution that then becomes the main um, pedestrian entrance of the hospital then moves to the back uh, in this concept that we've been um, investigating. How much more land is, is there behind what is shown on that slide? Um, well, that's a, so which directly uh, up? Up is the, uh, the uh, Woodbridge uh, Skilled Nursing Facility. Um, to the right is the highway, and then to the left is um, what we call MOBC, but it's a medical office building that we do not own. Um, we own two lots after that. And there's also a ravine um, that's yeah. behind the physical plan. Yeah, I think the last slide will show us an overview of the site and we can okay. find something. I think the pointer is in the middle, is it? Ah, there we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so this is the program that we have been uh, working uh, from in schematic design, which is six TCA beds, uh, eight tier one, 16 tier two, 16 tier three, um, tier one and two uh, located on the uh, same level with the central core and then tier three have been um, being able to separate off um, if we need to. And really the flexibility of the design has been kind of an overarching consideration because care changes over time. There's time between this stage and when we're actually seeing patients and everything's always evolving. So we want this building to, to uh, have a long lifespan and be relevant in terms of care. And so the flexibility of the space has been an overall theme uh, throughout the process. So on this uh, slide is the ED level. Uh, this is the TC that we're talking about. And you remember from the program we said six. So you see four that represent this TCA area right here. And then we have two that are medical surgical swing rooms, depending on which they need to be. They can open up into the TCA or open up into the ED to allow flexibility of space. Also, the space can be divided into sections um, as uh, to consider the appropriateness of the patient mix in the, in the space at the time. Uh, ambulatory ambulance would be in the back side here through this vestibule. If it's a medical patient, they come down this corridor to the appropriate uh, area of care. If it's a site patient, they come through one of these intake rooms and then into the space. The space has a secure elevator that then goes vertically up to the inpatient site unit. Uh, ambulatory entrance is on this side with the waiting. And then this is broken into two pods. Um, one would be the main pod that's open all the time. The other one would flex up and down throughout the day as the volume uh, necessitates it. So you can imagine you know, that normally you rush 3 to 7, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. all of units to be open, but from you know, uh, midnight to 6 a.m. we may only be on one unit because that's a lower volume time. So it allows us to be much more efficient. <coughs> Um, so going up one floor, this is the tier one and tier two units with the central support cord. Um, each, each of these units have access to outdoor space, which we've heard from the peer advocates how important that was. Um, the tier one does have an area that can be divided off if needed need to be. Um, uh, there's also some flexibility around the living dining area. The tier two 
Um, also, it's a flexible around the living dining area, and um, it's access to the outdoor space. And then um, this is, I see from the side of it, I think this is the vertical elevator right here. Um, tier three um, has a central core and the two distinct um, areas to that. Again, its own living and dining. It has outdoor space on both sides of this. Uh, this floor, we spent a lot of time about flexibility and how it be used over time. And so it's, it's um, really geared towards um, being able to provide the right kind of care. Um, should uh, we have a need for more tier two um, beds, then it actually can advance to a tier two if we need to. Um, this is the overview uh, slide that I was talking about. This is some of the stuff that we have been discovering in the process. And so we originally uh, changed the concept from the L right here because of what we call MLBA, but Mountain View, um, right here. So it remains without the, the building and the being more of a rectangle than the L that we originally pursuing. This is that corridor that then would come through and connect to the structured parking solution on the back side. Um, and then this would be the kind of new entrance of the hospital. One of the constraints that we had originally thought was uh, an unchangeable or immovable constraint that the power lines are not across the campus. They also have required easement to it that we can't build underneath. And you can see the impact it had when we built the oncology center right here and how that has that funny wall is because of that easement right there. Um, Velcro has agreed to move the lines. Uh, we'd have to pay for it, but it's would move the lines. This direction then opens up the campus to much more um, opportunities. What's the cost for that? I think it's a, uh, I'm going to give you approximately two million dollars. Two million? Yeah. But this is a tad less. I think is the original is the estimate we have right now, but I'm, I'm rounding up. Um, another. Um, uh, interesting site uh, uh, fact on the site is there from where you see the heliport is right here to what was traditionally the main entrance of the hospital is an eight foot elevation difference and it's you don't really notice it now as you're just walking up the building it's eight feet but as you push a building out um, to where this one pushes out to you have to solve that eight feet in a short distance and so it was a constraint that the Arctic spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we not build a huge retaining wall and have to overcome that. So there was a, uh, they have solved in the way they're going to create the lot, but, but that was an uh, issue that we have spent a lot of time on. Also, the geotechnical analysis, um, we learned that the ravine is right here. At one point, that ravine was all the way across here. And at some point in the history, I imagine before the hospital was built or during its construction, it was infilled with whatever they had at a time. Uh, which makes it a fairly unstable place to place a building, so we have to mitigate um, those unstable soils to build here. Um, so the same thing else that I wrote up, kind of the main talking points. Yeah. Okay, and on to the big. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you about um, three pieces of work that we've been um, engaged with over the past um, several months. Um, first of all, we had shown you um, quite a while ago our, um, the methodology we used to come up with the number of um, estimated additional inpatient adult psychiatric beds that we needed. And we felt it was time to um, refresh that data and update it. So we used the same model that I explained to you last time. Um, and um, we've, we've used now data from July 1 of 2018 to June 30th of 2019. Um, and run that through, run that through the model. We are now um, in the middle of internal, and we will soon start external reviews. Um, and we'll do the same thing we did back with the original model, um, um, taking our, our expertise both internally and ex externally to say, hey, this is our best shot. What do you think? Um, have we done a good job? And um, we'll take that feedback back, refine the model, and go. I think the other very large thing that's changed between when we originally did the model and today is that we have um, 
two um, additional sources of potential capacity that would, would influence our statewide need. And so one is the uh, 12 additional level one beds that are planned to um, open this spring at the Brattleboro Retreat. And the second piece that I think could have a measurable impact on that estimate of need is the new 16 secure residential that secure residential facility that's happening um, at Middlesex. And while that's only a net new increase of about nine beds, if my memory and math is correct, um, it's still important to get together and consider um, what the impact would be. So we're in the middle of engaging in those discussions, and um, I'd expect we'd, we'd have some settled thinking about this by the end of March. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. We can go to the next one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've also been working on two models to develop our financial performance. So with um, some really um, beautiful work done on the on a programming um, document for the inpatient psychiatry units and for the ED, um, we've used those and the floor plans that um, Jim showed you as the basis for talking about what's the staffing model that we would need to care for these patients appropriately. What kind of ancillary services do we need? What other kinds of expenses um, would we expect to put into an operating pro forma? So that work is well underway. Um, we are um, through the first phase of our internal review process. There will be um, more happening, but um, but a lot. it's a lot of work, and we're making very, very, very good progress. Um, the second model is a reimbursement model. So we're also thinking, okay, we know how um, many beds we have in, in the proposed facility, um, and then are building up on a tier by tier basis um, what we feel um, reasonable reimbursement assumptions and methodologies would be. Right now, we're using kind of today's payer mixes and, um, and payment um, assumptions. We used, um, as you can see on the slide, we brought in some external stakeholders to help us make this better. The conversations have been terrific, and we're very grateful to all of the, the folks from the Green Mountain Care Board, to the Department of Mental Health, um, to um, Alicia Cooper at Diva, I could go on and on, um, Tom Boris from One Care, but it's been, they've been great conversations. Um, we feel that uh, collectively, we feel that we have a good methodology for, um, for today's um, payment picture. Our next step now is to go and think about future state scenarios. So what will our reimbursement, what could our reimbursement picture look like um, in 2024, in 2029, and so on. So I think that's the, that's the good work that lies ahead of us, but we've got the right people, I believe, around the table to do that. So um, all the work to date has really um, informed the process. We've been uh, committed to continuing to be transparent with work um, and engaging stakeholders. I can tell you that in the last three months, some of the discoveries that we've made as part of this very thorough process have eliminated um, some challenges, some of which Jim has um, reviewed with you. Um, so a, a grade difference of nine feet um, and fill that um, is not suitable for uh, a build of this level of both height and weight um, are all challenges. Solving for those challenges um, is a cost. And so each one of those challenges that came forward, we've been um, in working towards what would the appropriate solve for those challenges be. So um, as soon as we had some high-level cost projections, we've included those in the Green Run uh, Care Report, and we're presenting those today. Um, the challenges that we discovered, as I've mentioned, are the unforeseen building site conditions. I don't think any of us um, certainly were here when the building was built in 1968, um, or some of us weren't, and uh, we had no idea that um, the fill was of the the level of quality uh, it, it is. So um, to get down to bedrock would be um, uh, quite a challenge. 
Um, again, the architects and the um, geologists are, uh, have solved for that, but there's a cost. So what's the cost of that mitigation? Uh, we, we don't have definitive costs at this time. We will buy the next report. Um, they're still underway, they're high level. So what we're prepared to share is the high level overview um, of approximately 150 million total for the entire program. The additional um, complexities of interfaces with this building. How much of that 150 million is just the inpatient acute site bed? Just the beds itself? Yep. Um, I don't have that level of detail with us today. I'm mean, something we could provide at a later date. Um, what we were working on is total project costs, and so anything that we would do to break that out would be on an allocated square footage basis of some kind. And so, yes. I mean, how do you allocate how much of the cost of um, uh, mitigating the front entrance to the site build? How much do you mitigate or, or the solving the eight feet? How much is really assigned to this? The site kit, and so we kind of have to figure out a methodology for this question and some of the detail. And I get that, I guess I'll just get some frustration off my like shoulders yeah, yeah. now with another thing that's sure. behind me. But um, clearly, we as a board were very interested in the whole campus. Center for Vermont Medical Center is a hospital that we are concerned about um, because it's not in the black on the operating margins. Um, and so we need to have that overall picture of what the future is there. But then we have to separate that out from a particular order that we made two years ago, which was just for inpatient acute psych beds. And I think um, my fellow board members, although I haven't had a chance to talk to all of them individually, probably share my frustration uh, whenever there's a delay. And we understood the uh, Mountain View delay and, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, it was a tough decision at the time for board members whether or not to do across the board commercial rate decrease, which would have benefited all the monitors at the time. And at the time, the board felt very strongly that there would be a better return to Vermont consumers by, you know, addressing the shortage of inpatient acute beds. And so the order was pretty specific about the $21 million towards inpatient acute site beds. And in your written report that you sent to us, um, the 1.1 million includes a lot more um, than just a focus on those inpatient acute site beds. So we're gonna require that the milestone reports, which are specifically for the inpatient acute site beds, should only include those dollar amounts that relate to that and not to designs for a new emergency room or things like that, even though we're very interested in that. But um, as far as us tracking the flow of the 21 million, we want to make sure that all that 21 million goes towards the construction of inpatient acute psych beds. So that's the first frustration. And I think um, I see in the audience, I saw him leaving <coughs> off, and I thought that um, his piece in Digger really was a, a reflection of everybody's frustration that nothing happens quick enough. And as someone that's done a lot of construction in the past myself, we would have loved to have the most lavish theaters when we were building them. But when we sat down, we always, the first step was to design the, the least cost possible alternative, and then figure out from there what could be done to that to um, make it more attractive to the patrons as they come in. And so it's kind of disturbing that here we are two years out and everybody's overwhelmed at this huge cost estimate, which is way beyond um, what anybody had envisioned. And so I'll just leave it at that. I've got it off my chest, but I, can, I just want you to understand that everybody's very frustrated, as I'm sure you are too. I can see it in, in your faces that you share that frustration and um, it's not always easy but we have to uh, try to figure out if there's any way that we can make up the difference in the time that's lost as everybody's going back to the drawing table is there anything that could be done to try to expedite the construction without costing more dollars and things like that so um, i'm done with my rant so um, thank you for expressing you know, your concerns.
concerns. Um, and I would say that the team is um, feels, to your point, some of those same frustrations. The challenge with building a complex structure of this, um, which we were committed to, to making it part of um, integrated part of a health system campus, is that there are challenges with that. There, there's no doubt. And with those challenges are costs. Um, the process that we used, I'm comfortable with um, the notion that it was um, had experts around the table. We listened to peer advocates. And I, I will assure you that no one was trying to design something that was um, exorbitant or um, frivolous. I think the design, both the program design and the schematic design, um, were very thoughtfully done. It was a very iterative process. Um, and so I, I just want to reinforce that. The challenge when you are building on a campus that's already cited is that you identify, which we have in the last three months, challenges that were not foreseen. Um, a nine, I'm not trying to mitigate the fact that a nine foot difference between the entry of the campus and where this new building is cited is, is a significant elevation difference. How you enter the building and exit the building and keep the rest of the campus uh, functioning was also a significant challenge. We didn't go well, in. Some things pop up immediately to mind, like if you're going to have to do soil mitigation, can't you take that soil that you've got to remove and build up the helicopter pad so it's at a higher level? Because yeah. that only has to support the weight of the helicopter. Um, and then you're replacing the fill there. I mean, it just seems like these aren't insurmountable problems if the right people are at the table and trying to figure it out. And, and we believe that they're not insurmountable, to be honest. Yeah. We think we can find solutions that will keep and I also want to reinforce that a lot of all the programming work and schematic work is not is not lost. That work can be repurposed coming back to what is going to be core, working with the design teams as we have to meet the, the goal that we set for us, which is to impact the care and treatment of adult and patient psychiatric pain. We are still committed to that. We're still committed to doing that in a time frame that is as realistic as it can be when you're building a healthcare facility versus another type of facility or a non-healthcare facility. So we are still committed to that. We don't believe that this will set the entire project back significantly. But I will also, I, we've been very transparent from day one. Um, that's something we are committed to. Um, and you know what we know right now. I can tell you what we are also are committed to is taking all the good work that's gone on so far and going back and looking at things like, can we do this in a different way that still maintains the program, that still maintains the schematic design that was very thoughtfully put together by all the processes we have, and can we mitigate some of the cost? So we're committed to doing that. And I'm confident that with the good work of this team and others that have been part of this process, we'll find a solution that isn't 150 million. But it would be- What's the time for finding that solution? We're looking at, at this point, about six months. What's the target range you're looking at for the cost to come in at? So that's a quite a conversation that we're having internally um, within the network. And um, we're meeting this week to, to understand exactly what that what is that number so that we're very clear so we can drive to that. We did not go in, and I think you know this from the reports we've given, we didn't go in with a number in mind. We went in with let's design a facility that will meet the needs of the patient through the process that we've described in the previous six reports. That was purposeful. That wasn't a by happen chance. That was the recommendation of the people that build these type of facilities all the time. And so what none of those people could have identified is some of the discoveries we've made on our campus. We didn't even know some of those things existed as constraints. And mitigating those constraints are a cost. I do believe that we're going to come back with something that is much more realistic and still maintaining, and we are committed to still maintaining the ultimate goal, which is to ensure that psychiatric patients receive inpatient acute care in the appropriate setting. That's our commitment. But I appreciate your expressing your frustration. 
How long is the uh, six months um, of that construction timeline? Because obviously it's certain months of the year they can do things in the lot. So does that mean that it pushes it back out further? I think we'll know much better once we have the concept. And so I think um, generally in order to shrink a project from the size of something meaningful means scope, right? And so if depending on the size of the building where we place it, that it could compress the, the 30, to six, 30 to 36 months we're kind of thinking construction would take. And so that's why we're thinking we may not have affected the overall timeline that much because I think we're going to make it up as we keep going through the process. So I think part of what you're seeing now is we're sharing what we discovered and maybe we're still working on a solution. And so the next time we're in front of you, you know, we're having a meaningful conversation about what we learned from this and what is the next step. Is there a way to do things with the current data that's available that you don't need a parking garage? What's difficult about the site is that um, what the study showed us is we're short 44 spaces right now just on, on a normal day. And so anytime that we take any um, part of the campus and put a building on it, we cr create the area, you know, heighten the problem. Um, there's also, you know, I guess, you know, there's a, the concept of, you know, are we really okay continuing to cover green space with asphalt and parking cars for acres? You know, isn't it a more, uh, you know, social, socially uh, prudent thing to try to compress just how much green space we're covering with asphalt? And so I, I don't think we should be scared of a parking structure. I don't think that the solution because of, I think we can solve this particular stage without a parking structure if we rethink the scope, but I don't think that in future conversations we ought to be afraid of it because we're really taking up, you know, beautiful Vermont green space with covered with asphalt and we ought to think differently about it. I will tell you also that part of the discovery, we, we have been told, at least certainly through my tenure and the other master's facilities planning that we've done, that the um, trans large transmission lines, Velcro lines, were immovable. That was just a system property. And you can tell that in previous buildings before my tenure, they actually designed a building with a corner cut off to, for that easement, which it was illuminating to me when I first rounded through that building to understand why would you design a building without with a corner that's not there anymore. And then it became clear when we saw the area why that was. It was the easement issue. So um, in the past, what we've heard is um, that's immovable, that's a, that's a constraint, can't change that. I'm, I'm grateful to say that with our conversations with that company, um, they are open to shifting where those power lines are recited. That opens up an opportunity for us that didn't exist even three months ago. So it's a cost, but I think that cost um, will pay returns and that it allows us, that was, a prime, that was a huge constraining effort for us. We could not build in that area. Um, so we may be able to site the, this plant in the physical location of this building in a slightly different way that will keep, get us away from the ravine, get us away from that gradient difference. So uh, again, I'm not convinced that we haven't, um, we, I know we haven't looked at all those potential options, um, but that is part of this journey. Um, it is one, you're discovering one thing at a, um, at a time. Um, and clearly all of these lessons learned will inform the next uh, phase of this work. But I think it's really important to reinforce again, we are absolutely committed to not wasting time doing this work. We are moving as quickly as we can. We've been committed to moving quickly. I know it's not quickly enough for patients that are waiting in these around the state. I, we all understand that. I'm a clinician, I understand that very well. We are committed to trying to solve for this in a way that's economically feasible, not just for the network, but for the state of Vermont and for our patients and families. We are committed to that. Questions from the board? Tom? Well, I'd like to go uh, back to the discussion a little bit about kind of rerunning the models just to see kind of uh, how things 
uh, sugar off today as opposed to uh, when we did it last time. And um, just kind of wondering, when we went through that process, which was an elaborate process, we ended up with a 25 to 29 bed range and then settled on a 25 bed um, range. And I mean, it may be, but I think that in terms of you going back and running the model again, is that more for information's sake, or um, is it is there a purpose behind it to adjust the number of beds? Thanks for your question. Uh, there's two there's two reasons uh, that come to mind right away about why it's important to run the model, um, and, and so one is. Um, are the assumptions that we originally had still holding? So, and I think we can say, for example, um, are we at full capacity with our current inpatient adult psychiatric beds? I think we all know the answer to that question is yes, and we see the, the impact of that with our with borders continuing to be in all of our emergency departments. Um, but we also wanted to check on length, length of stay assumptions and so on and so forth. Um, the other piece is that there were pieces of that work that informed how we designed the number of beds we needed in each of the three tiers that we designed for the building. So we wanted to see if within that number any of the, of the mix changed. What isn't changing is, um, is you'll recall that we came to you and said the maximum number of additional beds that we can build is 25, and that is to keep, to ensure that CBMC does not run into issues with the IMD uh, requirements. So that's clearly kept in mind. So you might say that anything above 25 additional beds is a little bit academic, um, if you will. We will not, this doesn't have to be a very long process. And again, we, all of the hard work that went into that original model, um, Again, we're, we're leveraging that um, very quickly. So I hope that answers your question. It does. It says it. Well, what I, the small takeaway I, I, I take from that is that the number of beds might go down. I mean, um, uh, you know, things aren't totally cemented yet, um, but the number of beds might, might go down. It's definitely don't know because of those federal requirements of, of the number of beds you can have in one facility. And just, oh, could I just, um, just to remind you that actually the initial estimate of additional beds we needed was between 29 and 35 um, when we factored the, the future growth in. So if that helps set the stage. And we, um, with our IMD analysis, said the most we could build, the most, the highest number of additional beds we could build was 25. So as I recall, I forget the exact number of psychiatric beds that you have now is like 13? 15. 15. And so if you take the 15 and you add it to the 25, which is kind of what's in the plan now, could change. Could we go back to the um, uh, um, schematics and show us where the, uh, our, if, are, are the beds that are in these tiers, do they add up to the total number of psychiatric beds? Yes. yes. So that should be 15 plus 25, um, that should be 40 beds. Right, and so, so today's program is eight tier one beds, highest acuity patients, 16 tier two, medium acuity, if you will, relatively speaking, and 16 tier three beds uh, in the program I reflected in the uh, And that adds up to 40. That adds up to 40, yeah. Um, my next, uh, I mean, I, I wanna underscore a bit of what Kevin had to say. Um, I was new on the board at the time, and it was my first no vote um, um, in terms of, of, of this project, thinking that the staff came to us originally in, in March of uh, 2018 and was asking, was saying, was used to $21 million for a 2% rate cut. And, um, you know, there was, an, <clears throat> there was a, an option I proposed. It didn't even get a second. so. Uh, maybe it wasn't that good, but I, I liked it. Um, <laughs> but you know, so but the point I'm trying to make is that that we were looking to put that that money to good use, and the psychiatric bed uh, concern was prevalent throughout the entire system. I know when I was joining <coughs> hospitals, 
You go into an emergency room, you see people behind the curtain, you see a sheriff there with a gun. I mean, the need uh, was unmistakable. And I applaud Jess for taking the lead you know, that, that she took you know, on, on this issue. Um, but I think that our sense was that this is something that's got to move pretty quickly, uh, at, you know, as fast as it can. But uh, this $21 million, and, and the wording in the vote is solely for uh, these beds. And I, I'm worried that now things become entangled and that we can't uh, keep things uh, kind of clear. And I, so I go to the letter from Dr. Brumstead on page page 8 of 16, in the last budget report that we got on the $21 million uh, before the, the most current was in May of 2019, and the total was $94,000 at that point in time. And now this letter reveals that um, and that number is up to $1.18 million. But it's, I assume that these numbers, that's just not associated with the psychiatric beds. That's the parking garage and the emergency uh, department, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm um, kind of going back to where Kevin was, is what is the benchmark that we should be looking at as to what is a reasonable cost per psychiatric bed and track that um, in my uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of amateur approach to it. I have done, like Kevin, some construction in my life, and uh, but in my amateur approach to this is just to go out there on the web and see what are uh, the cost per bed for psychiatric beds and projects that have happened in the last two years. And and I've I found a number of them, and the range um, is <clears throat> between. $340,000 a bed and $534,000 a bed. I have no idea whether or not that's a, 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 an important North Star, but I am looking for the North Star on this, is that what should, what should we be spending per psychiatric bed um, and to have it tracked in a way that it doesn't get lost in the overall massiveness of this project. I think the total project is much bigger than the 25 beds. And I'm just, I'm just worried that uh, uh, that um, we lose track of the costs associated with these beds. So, um, um, thank you for expressing that. Um, what we're doing as we evolve this project is to try to become more clear with what the cost is for each entity or portion of this project. The challenge with a project like this is we're not building a standalone psychiatric facility um, in a greenfield space. If, if we were doing that, likely the cost would be significantly less. We are building um, adjacent, and this was a desire expressed by many, um, that the care of psychiatric patients be normalized and part of care as part of an integrated health system. So we've committed that that as a network makes sense in a central location like Central Vermont. The other pieces that have accompanied this have not been ads um, that are not related to the care and treatment of psychiatric patients. So the addition of the ED into the project which we came before the board and sought approval to move ahead with that planning was uh, based on the data analysis that showed that 80% of our patients that end up being in an acute care setting and requiring acute care come through the emergency department. Yet our de emergency department at CDMC is far distant to where we were looking to site this, which would make um, for clinical and safety issues for transferring those patients from the initial site of entry into the organization being our current ED to where this bill would be occurring and where they would be eventually cared for. So we moved ED into the planning and accelerated that process so we could keep it conjoined with the care of um, inpatient psychiatric care as well. So each of these additions have not been added um, um, without care and um, thought around how it relates to our primary goal, which is the care and treatment of inpatient psychiatric care. So all of those additional pieces do add to the cost. Um, and that, I mean, honestly, 
that that's where we are. And so what, when we identified what that number was, and again, it's high level cost estimate, we're going back and we're saying, we know we can't afford $150 million. Um, we can't afford it as a network. We don't think the state of Vermont can support it as well. So we'll need to go back and see, with these other discoveries that we've made, like power lines being moved, can we cite this in a place and address some of these issues, again, all with the focus of addressing those patients waiting in EDs across the state of Vermont every day. That's our primary goal. We have as much interest as anyone in trying to do this as quickly as possible. We also are committed to doing it as well as we can with the input from all the stakeholders that have been part of this to date. Um, I hope that helps to give a, a bit more context on how these other pieces have been added. I think what we can do, and we'll always certainly take back to our team, is can we divide the report going forward so we're more clear around, as we have more clarity on the actual cost for just the beds, what that cost is. We will do our best to do that. I think the challenge is allocation of things that Jim was describing of how much of what we're doing is associated with this population. And, and that becomes a little bit more of a challenge, but we will certainly take that feedback back and see what we can do to make that more clear going forward. One, one more question. Um, at one point in time, uh, when there was 150 beds at Waterbury, uh, that was entirely a state-supported entity um, as much of an antique as it was. I mean, it was, it was totally state-supported. And the facility, the psychiatric facility that's up on the hill with you um, is also entirely supported by the state. Um, and I, uh, I'm just wondering if, if you have any expectation that non-healthcare funds, that but state funds, will be available to you to help with this project. Um, what I can say is that we are prepared to have those conversations with the state of Vermont to explore the potential for support to meet this need for the state. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions from the board? Uh, just a couple. Um, one is a programmatic question, and that's with respect to the recent concerns about the financial viability of the Brattleboro Retreat and you know the recognition or the highlighting of the fact that that's the only place in the state that takes care of children and adolescents in patients. So one question, maybe this is for Eve, as you're kind of going back through the modeling of beds and, and thinking about beds and programs, um, is there any sense in which thinking about having some beds capacity for children so that we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak? Diversifying a little bit. Um, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, part of the decision to focus on the adult patient population was one based on the data um, that there that was the most immediate need. The other piece was keeping in mind that we were going to provide the service within um, the Central Vermont campus proper. Central Vermont does not um, currently have a pediatric inpatient program. So um, that is a huge limiter in the care and treatment of pediatric psychiatric patients. Um, so we um, are looking across the network to see how that capacity can be managed within the network for care and treatment of pediatric patients. But that was the limiter of why we're focused on the adult population. Um, again, totally um, agree with you that the need for pediatric inpatient care is real. It is not uncommon for us as well as ED around the state to have pediatric patients waiting for extended periods of time. Clearly not therapeutic to do that in the ED. Um, but our limiter was that we do not currently have an inpatient pediatric program in Central Vermont. The, our children's hospital is sited in Chittenden County at the UVM Medical Center. And I guess my second question then is sort of a follow-up to that as you're thinking about your whole network. and I would. Ask also as you think about the entire hospital system in Vermont, given that there is going to be a delay, and I understand the reasons for the delay, and I appreciate all the efforts that you've undertaken you know, to think carefully about this. Do you see, particularly as a clinician and people who are really involved in this knee deep in the data, are there any short-term measures that we can do in the meantime, especially now that there is going to be a delay, 
increased throughput to provide, I, I just wonder if you're seeing any opportunities for us to at least help in the short run. And I mean us broadly, the state, I mean the network, I mean VAS, I mean whoever, where do you see some opportunity? I think the opportunity um, is to continue the strong partnerships that we have with the designated agencies around the state. Um, I know, speaking for Central Vermont Medical Center, we have a very close relation to, to Washington County Mental Health. We work with them collaboratively on a variety of programs to keep patients outside of an acute care setting. Um, and we partnered very, very well with them, um, even in our EDs, to have um, peer support available uh, for patients that are coming in that have a psychiatric condition. And to the degree possible, um, we, and I know we're not isolated in this, other hospitals in the state are doing this, are assuring that we're only providing acute inpatient care where it's absolutely necessary. Um, so those kind of interventions and partnerships are, are underway and we're very grateful for those. Um, we're also looking at a number of um, other initiatives. Um, we spoke early on about um, a strategic plan for mental health and new partnerships with mental health um, in our primary care. So co-locating co um, psychiatric um, resources within our primary care so we're treating the patient holistically not just their medical and physical health but also their um, psychosocial health and so we're committed to as a network in particular advancing that notion of that kind of partnership happening in primary care and care and treatment more proactive versus um, the care that sometimes we're in now which is an acute, very acute or emergent care phase where those individuals are coming into our ED. Um, that's part of my population health focus. That's part of the direction we're moving in. And I think we, and I, I believe we, we've said and we continue to say those partnerships are critical. That what we're solving for, even with this, with all the work, is only one log of that log jam of psychiatric care in the state of Vermont. Um, and we will continue to um, explore those opportunities to do that outside of an acute care setting. Absolutely. Is there any capital campaign being conducted now to uh, tie into this project? We are prepared to, to launch a camp, uh, capital campaign to support this work. Um, to do that, we want to be really clear what we're going to be campaigning for. Um, but certainly, um, we, we've actually recently hired a development officer um, for our organization. We're very confident that that individual, along with the support of the network, um, will launch uh, an effective capital campaign to support some of this work, yes, absolutely. It seems like uh, a large portion of this project is more than just the site beds, and it seems like the community should be rallying behind trying to uh, bring the hospital into uh, um, what I would call the modern times. And uh, even even as part of the uh, psych unit, there appears to be some real opportunities for fundraising. And you take a look at, for example, the rooftop gardens. You would think there are probably several donors that might want a something family roof garden in that hospital. So I'm hopeful that you're very successful in that campaign. Other questions from the board before I open it up to the public? Robin? I was curious if the recent uh, strategic plan that the Department of Mental Health came up with, if that, how that has informed your thoughts about this project, or if, if that's still new to really have uh, inc been incorporated yet. It's, it certainly is new, um, but we are um, taking that report and digesting it with our colleagues in the Department of Mental Health and seeing what of that, um, that report um, would be impactful for us, not just for this project, but for the long-term care of our psychiatric patients. Yeah. It's always helpful to have that kind of resource available. Okay, at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public. Dale. Some of it I had trouble hearing, so I apologize if I'm asking a question that may have already been answered. But as I'm looking at the diagram, I've got some concerns. Um, and this one isn't as good in detail as what was up there. But putting the parking garage so far away has been concern about access issues. The people that are coming to visit the hospital are not always 
they aren't just runners. They aren't just people that can walk for miles. They, they might be in wheelchairs. They, they might have um, walkers. And I've seen this happen in other designs. They don't think in advance that everybody is not healthy that is pulling into the parking area. So what's the possibility of taking the parking garage and moving it up to where you've got the actual tier one, two, three, and roof gardens and putting that actually where the parking garage is, would that increase your ability to then expand? Would it also increase a better flow of traffic around it and I'm assuming some things as far as what else could be changed in the design. Yeah. And I don't know what the cost is and what I'm referring to. But you look really boxed in. And I think Hubbard Park has more parking than what you got in front of your Pier 1, 2, 3. Uh, thank you. So um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the placement of uh, that parking. And we actually tried to solve it more on the, what would be the west side of the campus and it put the parking so far away that it actually caused the problem that you were just describing. By putting it back there, you have, uh, and we are envisioning that first row was at, um, uh, handicap parking or accessibility parking um, and then right to the sky bridge then takes you directly into the building and into the lobby. And so when we did the kind of the preliminary study about the, the travel path, this was the shortest route. Um, but also the, the triangle outside the ED, a lot of that would be accessibility parking too and through the ambulatory entrance of the ED. And so we did put a lot of thought into um, just what your concern is. By flipping the building to the back side, it causes some issues when you think about the long-term master plan of the campus and how it is, but also in terms of the ambulance traffic. So now we force the ambulance traffic to circumvent the entire campus when there's pedestrians going through and other cars are going through trying to get to the ambulance entrance. And so that's all those conversations that kind of form the mass that we see right now. Follow-up question? Uh, hold on to that and I'll come back okay. to you. Representative Donovan. Um, thank you. I just wanted to comment because I've been very deeply involved on the work groups that have been um, spending a huge amount of time and energy into um, helping discuss, inform the design plan. And uh, first of all, I really appreciate and want to let the board know because the board had said work with stakeholders and uh, they really have very extensively and, and listened to the input and integrated it. Uh, playing a part in it. So um, so from that experience, I can let the board know um, it wasn't just about fitting with the master plan. It was fitting with what's the best delivery of quality of care. Um, and there was a lot of thought and good planning. It's, it is a big disappointment that it's not affordable to move that way because from a construction point of view, from a patient care point of view, for all patients in the hospital, um, it really was a good plan and well thought out, and uh, uh, you know now it's got a shift course, and it, it will be less ideal in a lot of ways, but it, it is important to move forward. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to just uh, help with a little bit of context, because I was also very involved in uh, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital construction, and so just as a reminder, um, the cost there was a little bit over a million dollars a bed. It was more than a million, I forget if it was somewhere in the range of 25 to $30 million for a 25 bed hospital. And I guess I would disagree slightly that um, a standalone is not necessarily less expensive because you've got a lot more infrastructure you also have to add. Um, but there are, if you think of other hospitals, uh, I think the Miller building was in the range of a million dollars a bed. I think that's for better or for worse in Vermont. That is what it costs. And what's important to remember in comparing to other psychiatric facilities is psychiatry is very different now. Um, psychiatry is finally recognized in its integration with all sorts of health conditions and particularly with our aging population. And the easiest small example is by codes, uh, architectural codes, 
psychiatric bedrooms are permitted to be smaller. You don't have all the equipment needs and so forth. As we got into the design and planning here, we recognized they needed to be medical size rooms because of the need for at least some of them right away to have that medical capacity, but for many more of them at, with the aging demographics to have the um, connected medical capacity, which requires more space. So right off the bat, that, that's adding square footage. So it's something to keep in mind in terms of that you know, cost per bed. And the last piece is intuitively say, well, this is a million a bed, we're doing 25 beds, that's 25 million, not 40 or 50 million. But the last piece is to, if you think about having 25 psychiatric beds in one part of the hospital and 15 on a different floor in a different section, uh, just in terms of operational uh, savings and, and quality of care and so forth, you, you wouldn't want to split those uh, unless there was some really easy connection that turned out to be feasible. So it really is about um, a 40 bed project, not a 25 bed project in terms of um, how you would want to have uh, an overall psychiatric unit. So I just want to commend the work. I know it's unfortunate that, you know, the hoped for directions, and I think before I got here, they explained some of, uh, of how that happened, but um, I think they were doing really excellent work and, um, uh, the stakeholder voice has been actively involved and it's much appreciated. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, first of all, hello Anna, Jim, and Eve. Um, my name is Dan Toll. Uh, I'm a worker and volunteer in the mental health community across the state of Vermont for such entities as Pathways Vermont, NAMI Vermont, and uh, the Department of Mental Health Adult Standing Committee. And um, as the team knows, uh, I've been a part of the PIP, the, the design team uh, for the project that, that we're addressing right now. Um, I've been representing peer support workers, as well as uh, the voice of someone who has mental health lived experience and has actually had, unfortunately, three visits to the psychiatric unit on the third floor of CVMC. And I say unfortunately not that they didn't treat me well, but no one wants to be inpatient psych, trust me. Um, despite the frustrations among various stakeholders uh, regarding the unexpected high costs and this two-year estimates, there are many of us in the mental health community that see a silver lining here. Um, this pause in reassessment gives the project leaders a chance to step back and take a look at less restrictive, more effective and lower cost options uh, than inpatient psychiatry. Specifically, I don't know what I'm referring to, and you probably are all well aware, this is my first visit to a Green Mountain Care Board, so okay. excuse me if I'm, I'm not uh, addressing this uh, appropriately, but Specifically, what I'm referring to are such things as peer respites, and uh, two examples are the Alyssum facility in Rochester and the Soterian facility in, um, in Burlington, as well as the use of the peer support workforce. Um, and of course, as for those of you who read the 10-year uh, DMH plan, uh, peer support is an integral part of that plan. And I know because I was part of the think tank that helped uh, craft that um, you know, very wonderful document that I hope is everybody in the state takes seriously. So what I'm interested in from, from you folks is what is your current thinking about doing a more comprehensive evaluation of the full spectrum of mental health services from the most restrictive prisons and inpatient psychiatry units to the less onerous and lower cost community services. Thank you for your comments. Um, again, um, 
as a net UVM health network, we're committed to making sure that the care delivery we provide in our acute care settings or our practices meet the standard of care um, and optimize outcomes for psychiatric patients. So we're very committed to that. We also, as ex expressed, are committed to continuing the partnerships that have been so rich, I think, not only through this process, but um, in, even outside of the scope of this particular project. To respond to your question of are, are we in a position to step back and really look at the full scope, um, we would rely um, on those partnerships and continue to partner, partner with the Department of Mental Health um, to inform in the ways that we can through our cl clinician involvement and other involvement in that process to be part of a full state solution. Um, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in the right position to speak to what our commitment would be to that, but know that we are continually committed to partnerships that continue to inform the care and treatment of psychiatric patients within the state and also with our national colleagues and other academic health networks. Thank you. Ken, did you uh, have a question? I saw your hand up earlier. Yes. And come on. Thank you. I have a, I'm sort of a new person too because I have been here for several months. And um, since I've had an opportunity to write a piece that I think you've all looked at, um, I'll try to make this you know less than 30 minutes of, of questioning. Um, it, it, it turns out, I mean, it is it is interesting. It's almost a year to the date that we all sat here. It was literally a day when there was this common agreement after a lot of work to resolve that there would be a 25-bed facility. And that was a big moment. And I, sta I stood up here and I said, one key ingredient is to expedite this project. And um, I have to tell you, the chair exhibited great patience. And today I want to uh, accuse the chair and the board of having unbelievable patience. I, uh, it takes my breath away how patient you are because I have to tell you that this delay is a devastation to the mental health system in Vermont. And I will definitely agree with others. It has been a pleasure working with the team. And I said that last year, but the product is unacceptable. And I'm almost a little shocked that there isn't more uh, concern, not only about the money, not only about the planning process, but about what's happening to patients in this system if this project is delayed another two years. And I, I do want to tell you that the consequences are enormous. Um, I cannot really explain how uh, good people and I was part, I'm part of the group, although I may be voted off the committee or something, how good people could come up with a $150 million figure. It, it, I'm just stunned. And the fact that there isn't more of a pushback, and there is some pushback, but it defies reason. We don't have time to go back and review. And with all the words, which I think are really heartfelt, to a large extent, as far as I'm concerned, you've been given a blank, blank page today with very little on it. No dates, no certainty, no cost. And so my question is, perhaps the time has come, one, to decide whether you want to go ahead with this project, assuming that it's going to be in 2024 if everything goes right now. And are there other alternatives? Or are there other alternatives that the University of Vermont could look at, the Medical Center could look at, to say we have $20 million to, to do some planning? So that's one question. The other question is, does the board want to consider setting some boundaries and limits? Maybe the board should say $40 million is sort of the outermost range that's practical. I, th I think the, uh, the psychiatric center cost about that, a little less actually, than construction. And um, at least set a marker so we don't come back with a figure that's just not doable, particularly in Vermont. There's a lot of expertise here around the table. We, it's not, it shouldn't be kind of a, just a fishing trip. And it's hard for me to believe that in the next month or two, you won't come up with a figure to say, here's a range that we're going to work in. 
The other issue is, and I'll go back to, I think, uh, Tom Pellon, who did, I think, have a good suggestion, which is to say, instead of just turning over all this $21 million, perhaps there should be a lot more guideposts to say, if, it's, if, it's, if the product isn't coming, despite all the good work and good intentions of good people, maybe the money has to then be removed and used elsewhere, or the money has to be returned. So those are, those are the kinds of questions that I have, and I appreciate your view. Well, Ken, you know, those are all the same questions that are probably going through each one of the board members' heads. Like, should we uh, open it up to others to use dollars to try to come in with a project that actually makes sense? But if you do that, you're going right back to, to square one, too. And so I think that, um, at least from my viewpoint, what we really need from Central Vermont Medical Center and UVM is a separation of costs. Because certainly we could set the parameters of what the, the site bed costs should be. And I think $40 million probably is a fair figure for that. But then you've got to tie in everything else that's going on here on the campus and things like that. And I don't think that um, the building of site beds should get slowed down by an overall redo of this particular campus. So those are things that I think everybody's thinking, Ken, and what can be done to do things quicker? One thing that automatically pops into your head is, listen, Miller opened, you know, with that previous space, could, could there have been opportunities to create site beds there, similar to what Rutland did with um, an existing floor space and converted that? And even using that existing floor space, I think they came in around a million dollars, too. So, you know, Anybody that thinks we're going to get something, you know, on the cheap is just kidding themselves. Um, but on the same token, I don't know how you go back to, to square zero and start again. I, I think that uh, the clear thing to do is to make sure that there's progress being made. I think there is progress being made, but it, at some point, you're right, if progress isn't being made for the building of these new site beds, then others have to have the opportunity. Robin. Yeah, I just want to say on the issue of putting a limit, the, our mechanism for putting a limit is called the certificate of need pro process. So I don't think we can do that through the hospital budget process. So I just want to be clear that I think that's a legal overreach. Well, I think I was talking about through the certificate of need progress process because basically um, we don't want to, to approve something that is going to triple the costs don't disagree of, with of you psychiatric there. Right. care I don't disagree in the state with of Vermont. Your sentiment. And, I and to, to be think clear. that um, you know a redesign of other things is going to ultimately factor into successful rate negotiations for the site beds, I don't think that's fair. I think that's why you need to have that clear accounting on the site beds versus the rest of the project. Because another goal that we have is not to drive up costs of care in the state of Vermont. So it, it, in between a rock and a hard place here. Other members of the, Dale. A follow-up question, um, so now accepting the design as is, and that we have a aging population, my question would then be, have you communicated with Green Mountain Transit about how you're going to get the traffic flow? Are you gonna have a bus that goes around there for those people that can't walk this campus? Um, is it a bus that would go like every 15 minutes? The parking spots that would be for the elderly or disabled, the key issue we're finding going forward, I hear this a lot, is you can make them accessible parking spots, but can you enforce so that other people don't use them other than the ones that actually need them? That's my question. 
Um, yes, we have um, security that patrols the parking lot now, and we can enforce the, the access to the handicapped spaces. Um, as far as um, a kind of a transit solution, we need to, and we were, were pretty early in this concept, and, and uh, we're showing where we are right now, just kind of sharing this is where we are now, and we need to come up within the next iteration that is, is something that is a buildable project. And so we have been thinking about how you transit the campus, but we haven't had the next level of conversations. This really ha happens in the next phase we would have gone into if we if this phase was something we felt like really looking forward to. So it, it's uh, yet to be discussed. Um, I do want to follow up on one thing. We're talking about a lot of numbers in, in, in listening to, as people quote numbers, we have to be very careful the difference between construction costs and project costs. What we're sharing with you are total project costs. The numbers I'm hearing are really about construction costs. And so just make sure that we're talking apples to apples. Does Central Vermont have a, a program? I know a lot of it does. We're, uh, we're volunteer drivers for people that uh, uh, Say, for example, um, you're going in for a colonoscopy. You can't drive yourself, and you can't just get on public transportation. So there's a, a system in place, and I think it's driving with love or whatever it's called. But anyways, does Central Vermont have a similar type of program? We do. Um, and we, we also work very closely with the Green Mountain Trans, um, Transportation um, to ensure that the bus um, patterns are appropriate for supporting not only our acute care setting, but all our uh, practices that are geographically dispersed. But we do also have a volunteer program that supports people. And that usually happens um, with um, at the time of service, so if they need support in getting to the main campus, um, or if they need support going to a practice, we'll work with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. We also have a nice partnership with as I mentioned before, Washington County Mental Health, and we will, we've partnered with them, um, their team and case managers to support patients in being able to uh, attend appointments. And sometimes that's a barrier itself of just um, going to an appointment. So we're, we've got a lot of creative ways in which we try to make sure that patients and families can access the care, uh, both on the acute care campus and in our practices. Other members of the public? Seeing none, we'll let you get back to try to figure out the solution. <laughs> okay, for me to start? Yes. So we're returning after last, last week's presentation of our proposal for the 2021 standard plan design. Um, in terms of what I wanted to address today was a brief look at the um, individual and small group enrollment numbers. This is data that, um, as it relates to the plan designs, could be, could be an informative piece. There are several other uh, follow-up questions that we were um, that we're prepared to address. In terms of timing, um, I thought we were scheduled for about an hour, but I should I assume go faster. Sure. And aim for more like 30 minutes or whatever is the right amount of time to give out the information. We're not trying to rush it. Okay. okay. Just want to ask about that in case. <laughs> So I'll start with this, and then I'll turn it over to uh, the individual side first. So a little bit of orientation here. This is, um, I'm starting with the individual market. This is uh, a combination of those individual market enrollees through Vermont Health Connect, and those enrolled directly th through the issuers. And it's de-identified, so it's illustrating where the uh, population is enrolled, but it's not saying which um, which health plan, and they are bucketized into types of plans. So I want to just make sure everyone's aware. On the vertical here is the uh, metal level itself, and then across here is the kind of plan type. So that uh, that's how we um, look at 2019 January versus. Am I missing? Okay, just have it. The um, January 2020 uh, figures. Um, also want to make sure it's understood that these NA cells refer to, um, there just isn't a plan type in that category. It's not that nobody chose that plan, but for example, the platinum plan only has a standard deductible. There are no other forms of the platinum plan. 
So just so everyone sort of understands that. And then coming soon, in a week or two, will be a deeper dive into the numbers here that uh, accompany the, um, the coverage map that includes the um, integration of Medicaid and some more kind of story behind the, the numbers here. So overall, this is the total for um, January 19 versus January 2020. Individual side enrollment is um, by these numbers down about 400. This expresses the same time period in terms of the percent distribution. There are no um, enormous differences here in terms of where the, excuse me, error, um, where the population has enrolled. This kind of a heat map, I think, is most informative. This is uh, January 2020, but it's illustrating the, uh, where the enrollment changes have taken place. So I think what we're seeing is, if you look at January, this January, there's a decrease in silver. Again, we're continuing with silver loading, so that I think what we're seeing, because there's an increase in the um, in gold and more significantly in bronze, and a decrease in silver, um, that's, that can be attributed to people taking their higher subsidies and buying up for gold or richer plan or down to the bronze with um, premium, high, you know, higher amount of premium subsidy. And as I said, the enrollment is, on the individual side is down approximately 400, around a 1% decrease. Okay, so moving on to the, on to the small group enrollment. Again, this is all, all of this population is enrolled directly through issuers, so these numbers are provided to from my health connect from the issuers and combined for the same kinds of, the same categories. So from January 2019 to January 2020, I think that's the name I'm excuse me. Um, it's up approximately 1,900 on the small group side. Again, to look at the kind of change heat maps, uh, again, we're seeing um, a modest increase on the bronze side, a slight decrease for platinum. Most of the increases for gold, where the small businesses are um, moving there. And then this red is the um, movement out of the um, no CSR silver because off the exchange to <coughs> the uh, small business side. And um, we want to encourage all of them to be in the reflective. There are a few stragglers. Uh, still in there from last year, you know, we can force the small business population to change. We strongly encourage that, but um, much less than last year. That's why we're seeing that decrease in silver uh, with no CSR. So that's a quick overview of the two market segments. I think, um, you know, to the extent that it's helpful, as we consider the plan designs, I just want to provide those, those talking points. And there is more to come in, in the next week or two. OK. Dana, can I ask you a question? Certainly on this before we go to the plan designs. So I, I just want to make sure that um, I'm looking at the uh, page on page three under um, individual enrollment, individuals by metal level and plant type. And then I'm looking at the bronze without RX um, a maximum out of pocket. And then kind of following that across to the 685 
covered lives. So this would be on page, page three. One of the first slides you had up there. See that uh, 685 or 86 covered lives under January 2020? Yes. So, um, as I'm looking at the plan changes that the board is being asked to agree to, um, it's in that plan, the bronze without RX limit. And so, is it the, the effect, projected effect? on the changes we're being asked to approve relate directly to those 685, 86 lives. You're talking about the shift of enrollment from here to here? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that's a way to look at it. Uh, it's a, because I understand this is a standard plan. It's, it's, it's not a non-standard plan. So I'm just assuming that um, the, the decision we make today will have some impact on the 685 lives under standard deductible for the bronze without RX out of pocket, maximum out of pocket. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. Okay. And um, are all of those covered lives below 400% of poverty? No, not necessarily. Okay. Thanks. I just had one question on the last page um, and the small group involvement. Um, is there any correlation that can be made with the total change in lives, which were 1879, the gold plan went up by 1900? I mean, is it possible a company with a small business could have looked at just really put, pushing people into the gold plan somehow, or just coincidence? So there's 1,900 more in the gold. I mean, about 1,900 more in total. And I wondered if it was just an option of what individual small groups are being presented. I think we'd have to look back at the, you know, peel back to the um, actual numbers from each issuer to, to give that story. I think that's a little bit surprising because subsidy doesn't play a factor in the, yeah. in this population. And I think we would expect maybe more in the silver category where they can buy the reflective silver. Um, so I think the- It's okay, I was just looking at you know, the total change, the total yeah. increase, and then such a big increase in the gold. I think this Everything plan, else, the high deductible health plan, is very popular. So I think this is the, you know, a lot of that is in this plan. So I think that's a particularly popular plan where the employer can perhaps subsidize the um, deductible amounts, and, yeah. and so it gives them that option. So I think we need you know, more detail behind those. Yeah, maybe stories. just the way it was formulated, because because mm -hmm. without that, there's not a lot of change elsewhere. A small amount of mm -hmm. reduction in silver and platinum. And kind of okay, thanks. Okay. Other members of the board. Okay. Moving on to one other piece of we were asked to follow up on was a uh, report on the volume of the uh, usage of the plan comparison tool. So in broad numbers, the um, usage of that during last year's open enrollment period, which was 11-1 through 12 15, 2018, was a little over 33,000 uh, page views. And then in the same time period for this year, 11-1-2019 to 12-15-2019 for the 2020 um, open enrollment, there were 23,000 page views. So it's about 10,000 less, still a robust number. And I attribute that simply, I mean, there may be more factors, but I would attribute that to last year being the first year for um, reflective and uh, silver loading. And so we were 
just as we are this year, but last year was a real emphasis on uh, looking at that, using that tool to uh, choose wisely and see what would work best for you based on your usage and budget. Um, so. I think you would intuitively think that this year would be more because there's such a price hike, but you're right. Last year with the reflective silver, this is a big change in me. Huge. Not that. People trying to figure that out, it's not easy. So. And then I know we were asked, that as the coordinator of the stakeholder group, I was asked to look at the VBID uh, concept and follow that through. We absolutely will for uh, next year. We're going to watch the public comment period and where that lands. Uh, and I want the question answered around what would the effect be on standard plans if it's still considered an optional um, factor for issuers, how will that affect standard plans if they respond differently? So um, we'll absolutely take that into consideration for, for uh, next year. So if it's all right, I'll move it along to and hand it over to um, Brittany Phillips from Wigley Consulting and then ask you to look at the, um, the document that was handed around because there were five questions there, just addressing it this way instead of um, by presentation. So take it away, Brittany, with the um, additional five questions. Great, thanks, Dana. Um, so as Dana mentioned, we've got a handful of questions here that um, we needed to take back and, and uh, review and research a little bit. So we're gonna skip around a little bit in terms of the, the context that we're looking at. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through the five questions we have laid out um, in the deductible in front of you and feel free to stop me if you have any questions as I'm going through. Um, so the first question was on the average cost of a specialist office visit based on the information provided in the federal actuarial value calculator. Um, this came up in context with the bronze plan without the, the pharmacy maximum out of pocket um, limit. And so for the bronze plan continuum stable, the average cost for a specialist visit is approximately $179 per visit. Um, for primary care physicians, it's about $161 per visit. Um, this does vary a little bit depending on which meta level continuum table you're looking at. I think within a, um, about $5 um, per visit, depending on if you're looking at the gold or silver bronze um, continuum tables. Um, so again, this came up on the context of the bronze plan without the pharmacy limit and the expanded um, de minimis range. So on the bronze plan with, um, without the limit, um, it is, is eligible for the expanded de minimis range because the PCP um, office visit copay um, is not, or PCP office visits are not subject to the deductible, and the copay applied there is less than 50% of the cost of the service. Um, so even though the deductible also does not apply to specialist office visits or generic pharmacy um, uh, scripts, the, and those costs are over 50% because the PCP office visit is less than that 50% um, reasonability check. Uh, this plan qualifies for that expanded range. Um, so the next question was, uh, we were asked was for a comparison um, of the range of the PCP co-pays relative to the standard plan designs in Vermont. So in that handout, we've provided a link to the public use file um, that include infer includes information on benefits and cost sharing for um, all two HP plans um, on the federally facilitated exchanges. Um, it also includes the plans that are on the state-based exchanges um, that rely on a federal platform in the state partnership exchanges. Um, I did want to know that some information is available on the plan on the exchange on the plans that are on fully state-based exchanges, um, but those haven't been released by CMS for the last couple of years. So I think the most recent information is the 2018 plan year. Um, but some states do uh, post that separately. It's just in a different location and not on the CMS website. Um, but there's a lot of information in those public use files. Like I said, it's, it's all QHPs that are offered um, for 2020 on those federally facilitated exchanges. So we also took a look at um, what the rate 
ranges look like for the um, standard plans in states that have standard plan design. There's a, about six um, states that have those. And so the table on page two of the handout shows the ranges of those co-pays. Um, so for the platinum plans, it's between 15 and $20. Um, for gold, it ranges between 20 and $30. Silver between 30 and four or 30 and 50 dollars, excuse me. And bronze has the largest variance between um, 30 dollars and 65 dollars. Um, so for all of these um, states that we did look at, all these plans that we did look at, the Vermont uh, standard plan designs are within the range. Um, there is some variance about over whether the deductible applies prior to the copay applying. Um, about half of the plans apply the deductible on the bronze plan prior to the copay, um, and the other half do not um, apply a deductible first. Um, only New York is really the only state whose standard plan designs apply the deductible at the platinum and gold level. Um, a couple of states get the silver level as well. Um, so again, based on these handful of, of states and these, these plan designs that we looked at, the Vermont um, co-pays for PCP office visits are, are within the, the range that we're seeing in other plans as well. Two. Okay. Great. So moving on to number three, um, we were asked to look at the um, trend for the medical out-of-pocket maximum and pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum. It was noted that the medical out-of-pocket maximum has increased significantly more um, year over year than the pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum and also um, increased increases more on the bronze plan versus um, the other meta levels. Um, so we briefly walked through this uh, during last week's call, but to reiterate and add some more um, numbers around it, since we have the specifics now, um, the pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum is limited to the minimal, minimum deductible for HHTs um, per Vermont regulations. Um, and so that uh, minimum deductible is determined each year by the IRS. Um, so over the years, since 2014, that deductible has, minimum deductible has only increased $150 or a little under 2% per year um, from 2014 to 2020. Whereas the allowable out-of-pocket maximum um, for the medical and pharmacy combined, which is released by um, CMS and in the notice of benefit and payment parameters each year has increased um, $1,800 or a little over 4% per year during that same time period. Um, so particularly on the bronze plan where the um, pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum is already at that minimum deductible limit and is at the highest amount it can go, um, that really kind of limits the changes that, that we can make to those standard plan designs year over year uh, to account for that. And so because we're limited on what we can do with that pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum, um, oftentimes it requires larger increases on the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximums in order to meet the de minimis ranges in, um, in the AV. Um, so additionally, uh, the medical out-of-pocket maximums has generally increased faster on bronze plans compared to other meta levels due to um, the leveraging impact of the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. Um, and what I mean by that is that on the bronze plans where the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums are already, you know, as of 2014, were quite a bit higher um, than, say, at the gold or, or platinum plans. Um, there's an expectation that fewer members will actually hit those uh, deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums. Um, and so therefore, in order to have, in order to reduce the AV, it requires um, a larger increase to the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums um, on the bronze plans versus um, a, a similar increase on the um, gold or platinum plans would have a larger reduction in the AV. Um, so it's kind of those two concepts is why we see the difference in trends between the metal levels and also between the medical and pharmacy um, limits. 
there any questions there? No, don't think so. Okay. Great. Um, we were asked, also asked for some more detail on the formula and process used to determine the increase in the um, medical out-of-pocket maximum each year. Um, so for 2021 in the draft payment notice, there's a $400 increase. Um, and that's really determined based on um, a very specific formula. So the um, formula is based on a premium adjustment percentage multiplied by the um, maximum out-of-pocket out from 2014. So the 2014 limit was 63.50, and each year that is multiplied by this premium adjustment percentage to get um, the new uh, limit for the current year. Um, and that premium adjustment percentage is based on um, the change in the average per capita premium for health insurance from the preceding calendar year um, compared to 2013. So for 2021, the percentage is calculated by comparing the 2020 average per capita premium to the 2013 average per capita premium. And that difference is um, how those increases are determined each year. Um, so I did want to note here that this formula changed a little bit in the 2020 plan year. Um, prior to 2020, uh, that percentage was only based on um, employer-sponsored insurance premiums, so it was a change in employer-sponsored premiums year over year. Um, however, starting in 2020, the formula now incorporates the individual and group market insurance premiums, so it does include the individual market as well as um, the small group exchange market um, in determining those those premium increases. Can I actually just ask a quick follow-up sure. to that? So Brittany, this is yeah. Robin. Um, so by including, I mean, it logically makes sense to base it on both employer and individual market premiums um, since the the uh, AV calculator applies to both, but won't that mean that that will result in a bigger increase because typically individual markets have higher increases than small groups nationally? Or am I making too many assumptions? Um, I think it's a little tough to say since we only have a couple years worth of that data, but I can say that I, I think generally what you're what your intuition is saying is correct. Um, the change in 2020 and 2021, um, since, they made, since they started incorporating the individual market premium, um, it has increased. So this year, um, the increase in the out-of-pocket maximum is $400 based on the draft notice. Um, whereas before 2020, the average was about $250 per year. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase in how much that
apartment is 100,000 lives. Um, in each uh, bucket that there would be a continuous cycle created for. So um, basically for each meta level, it, they require 100,000 lives included in the data to determine that. So um, from that perspective, it might be very impossible looking at Dana's um, previous enrollment sites for Vermont to meet those requirements without incorporating additional data sources beyond just the exchange market. Um, not to say that it's, it's impossible um, to do a state-specific um, calculator with additional data sources. It just may not be based solely on, on the exchange population. It may not be cost-effective um, so, given the exchange population. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, the primary benefits of creating a Vermont-specific calculator would be that, you know, the data underlying it will reflect um, be more aligned to actual experience in Vermont and those actual allowed costs, um, as well as the bucketing between um, you know the different service categories um, and plans could be better aligned. Um, and we've worked with uh, the Nature's data before, so um, that is potentially a viable source um, for the data that's already out there and kind of readily accessible. Um, the other, kind of the, on the flip side though, some of the cons are, again, the effort involved, whether it's cost effective, um, there's potential disruption in the plan designs, primarily in the first year of implementation. So um, using this national data and switching to Vermont specific data could result in some drastic changes in ABs in that first year um, that the plans will then need to compensate for in, in the plan design. Um, of those plans. So there's some, some movement that could happen there in that first year. Um, and then there's also, at, at this point, it's kind of unknown whether implementing the Vermont data will actually change the actuarial values in a meaningful way um, that, that makes sense for, for the plan designs. Um, so I, just like a high-level comparison of Vermont's allowed cost in total and by the different service categories in the calculator would probably be warranted um, in order to understand how impactful this change could be before you know really going down this path. Um, so just in general, if Vermont wants to consider a state-specific ABC, um, we would recommend discussing um, with CMS, uh, there may be additional flexibilities beyond those that are outlined in just their, their methodology documents for the state um, ABC um, or requirements that have changed possibly since these, these were released. So. So at this point, I'd like to switch back, uh, if we could, to um, Abigail. Can we get up the presentation from last week? I want to review the um, some question around the chiropractic and PT co-payment. So while Abigail is doing that, my assumption is that there hasn't been any legislative movement yet on the bill. Do we know? Um, not that I'm aware of. That is correct. This came up with the Vermont Chiropractic Association. The bill was reviewed today in the Senate Health and Welfare, um, but it was not, there was no decision. Thank I you. I will say that um, they did decide to put PT into the chiropractic bill, to also include PT. Okay. I don't want to make anyone see stick, but I'm moving, <laughs> no, I'm moving to. So I'm on slide 16, Brittany, I just want to uh, point out where we misstated here in the first bullet on both sides. In fact, the, you know, as it stands, the requirement is for those co-payments for bronze and silver plans to be in the range of 125 to 150. Currently, for the 2020 plan year, they are at the, uh, they set at the 125 limit 125 level rounded upward to the nearest $5 increment. And I'll show you um, where that plays out. 
So I apologize for that misstatement here. Um, Okay, so here we are printing now on the on slide 26. Um, the PCP office visit at $35. The um, for 2020, the chiropractic and PT co-payment is at $45. $125 puts it at an upward place somewhere around. $43 and change, so we rounded it up to this $45. Um, and we propose bringing it to $40, anticipating implementation of this um, uh, new legislation. <clears throat> and again, wanting to, there was considerable discussion among stakeholders about uh, for co payments like this to, to keep, keep at a $5 increment, we thought was important. Um, and like I said, it is awkward for some of these plans, but, you know, depending on where the um, primary care office visit cost is, at a uh, 125 level specifically, can, can bring it to an awkward spot. So uh, for this plan, and for this one, the same thing, where the primary care office visit is at 35 it was in 2020, not proposing any change to that, but again, the proposed level of $40. Um, we feel strongly it would be good to do that for, um, you know, to keep with the $5 increment and not to be in a position where we had to, if we left the co-payment at $45, and then found out later in the spring or summer that that needed to change at that point. It's, it's difficult and awkward operationally to need to go back to change those plans. Let me just point out too that for the other bronze plan where the primary care office visit is at 40, the chiropractic and physical therapy payment fits neatly at 125% already, so no change there. <coughs> Brittany, anything you wanted to add there on this on this piece? I would just say that um, when we looked at making the change on the silver and the bronze plan with the pharmacy limit, going from a $45 copay um, down to $40 is really a pretty small impact in terms of AV and, and the premium impact so it, it less than 0.1 percent um was the impact there so it's, it's pretty small in terms of the actual impact on the ad and, and the estimated premium for this change so just to confirm my understanding so if the bill passes with the plan designs as proposed with the reduction in those co-pays uh, then the plan designs would be compliant. If Perfect. the bill does not pass, then the lowered copay would be non-compliant with state law because Correct. it would be because under 125. Okay. And if so, if the bill doesn't pass and the forty dollars is non-compliant, would you then keep it at the current copay? Is that really what you're thinking? Yes. I think being it was more likely that it would pass and that you know, sure. yeah. um, proposing it this way um, to makes it most us. likely to <clears throat> no, that makes sense. I'm just since I'm assuming I'm the one who's doing the motion, I need to make sure I understand the conditionals. <laughs> you can <assume> correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and again, just trying to anticipate and, and avoid the situation of having to change that co payment mm -hmm. at, a, at an awkward time for the issuers and the exchange. So those are the things we get prepared for today. So, um, are there questions from the board? Tom. So, so Dana, I'm just uh, kind of curious about, uh, and I think you're on page 35, so that would be a fine one. Um, the, the very bottom line where it says estimated premium impact, and under the 2021 recommendation design, it's three-tenths of 1%. 
and the alternative design is one tenth one percent. What is the math about that? I, I talked a little bit to Mike today about that, and we just weren't sure. But but the um, the thought was that that is the incremental impact on the premium of just these changes in plan design, independent of any healthcare trend, pharmacy trend, et cetera. Correct. Uh, I think I'll ask Whitney to uh, provide more background with that. We, we did address that on an earlier slide, but it's a model built by Wakely, and it's very different. Understand that we want to be right in front that it's different than the um, modeling that each issuer will use for pricing. But it's, its value is it gives us, as a stakeholder group, a sense of the kind of directional impact on premium based on some good assumptions. Um, you know, is it smaller or larger um, premium impact to make a certain change? And, you know, depending on the, you know, we, were, we had some discomfort with raising that um, specialist office visit beyond $100. That's why I think it landed in the um, alternative recommendation, and, you know, in this particular uh, plan design, but by doing that, that one has that impact of bringing down the anticipated impact. But Brittany, can you provide um, more background around the math in that model? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we've tried to show here with the estimated premium impact, you're correct, it is we're trying to isolate the impact of just these plan design changes. So it doesn't include medical trend, it doesn't include um, changes in the morbidity of the market or, you know, if, if an issuer goes through provider contracting changes, it, it doesn't include any of those other changes that are ultimately going to influence the final premiums of these plans in 2021. We're really just trying to focus on the plan design um, impact and isolate that piece. So as Dina mentioned, um, that premium impact is based on uh, Wakely's internal proprietary model. Um, and so the data underlying that is quite a bit different than what's underlying the, the federal ABC. Um, we have a set of individual um, ACA data that we collect from carriers nationally, um, and that's what's underlying that data. But ultimately, the difference between what we're seeing in terms of the, the change in the ABC, AB, and the premium impacts is really just the differences in um, utilization and cost of services as well as methodology between the two models. And so it's really meant to give you kind of two different data points. So the ABC, um, th those changes is kind of one, one checkpoint of what the potential plan design changes are worth in terms of premium. Um, and then the estimated premium impact Again, using Wadley's model, it's, it's another data point to try and kind of quantify those, those differences. So um, the difference between the recommended and the alternative plan design, uh, so the 0.3% premium impact on the recommended and 0.1% premium impact on the alternative, um, kind of show, shows that a $10 increase in the specialist office visit is worth more um, in terms of the, the AV um, change than the $5 increase on the generic. So it actually is a little bit, you can see it's a little bit opposite of what the ABC shows, whereas the change in um, AV from the ABC is actually larger on the alternative design versus the recommended. And it's really just driven by those differences in the underlying data between the two models. Thank you. Um, just a couple of other questions. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the bronze deduction plan without the uh, the pharmaceutical limit, and um, and looking at the increase in medical deductible, and that is a 6.3 percent uh, increase. And that's just kind of the math. And then I kind of you know, but keep that keeping that in mind. I plug in the 2019 premiums for Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield. For this plan, which is um, $1,120, and uh, per month, and multiply it by 12, and you get $13,450. And the um, 
you know, 400 percent of poverty level, uh, that 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 level that is the the premium cliff for a couple of two is 68,960. And so I'm not looking for a long discussion here, but I'm just wondering um, if Diva at some point, uh, um, you know, I mean, I, I you know. I, I just think this cliff is just such a steep cliff for some people that are middle class Vermonters, maybe at an age where they're trying to get their kid through college or save for retirement. And I'm just, and the study that you folks had um, done by Wakely showed that for, you know, 2.2 million on an annualized basis, 1.1 million in 2021, because it's only a, a half a year, the overlap of fiscal year and calendar year. Um, are you dead set against a proposal that um, that would expand the premium assistance program to those over 400 and 400 percent to 500 percent? Absolutely, hear the concern around affordability, and um, I do know that based on our conversation on affordability last week as well, uh, Eddie Stremlo will bring that back for more discussion with the leadership. But it's just not. I'll just pay for it, be fair. I, I, I know, uh, but he might know something. <laughs> um, and finally, my, my last one is on the benchmark plan for 2022. Um, are, are you uh, con considering opening that benchmark plan uh, to, which hasn't been looked at, I think, since 2012 or 2013, to get it aligned with the um, you know, as, as we voted on, on the non-standard plans, to get it aligned with the um, all-payer model or the Vermont health care um, goals um, more appropriately. Um, was you, you may be aware that we've convened a group to look at you know, the process to uh, more frequently review the benchmark plan and consider other alternatives. Um, so that is ongoing to get you know, a better um, kind of more repeatable and uh, dependable process. Um, but I can say that the CMS deadline for, which would require CMS for approval for 2022 is coming up soon in May, so it's much more likely that uh, the soonest would be 2023. Um, to get to be thoughtful about that, consider you know, all kinds of factors and things to build into a new benchmark plan would be, you know, it's a complicated process. So, uh, absolutely open to looking at it, but hard to say exactly when the um, right time to jump would be. Well, I mean, I appreciate that, but I've also seen, you know, for example, when the, the Brigham decision passed uh, on February 15th and whatever year it was, 1994-95, that Act 60 happened through the legislature by June of that year. Um, so government can move back sometimes, and it just seems to me that, that the fact that we might be revisiting the benchmark plan after the um, all-payer, the current all-payer uh, model agreement is, uh, is finalized, it just seems to me a missed opportunity. Other members of the board, Robin? No, I just have a motion when you're ready. You want to make it before we take a public comment? Sure. I, what I was thinking of doing was maybe having two different motions, one specific to the chiropractic and uh, physical therapy, and then the second on the overall recommendations. It just seemed a little bit easier. Does that sound OK to you, Kevin? It does, and I think that I uh, um, want to be careful without knowing what your motion is going to be, <laughs> uh, to make sure that um, we're obviously within the statutory boundaries. Yes, of so. course. OK, so um, then my first motion is going to be that we approve a chiropractic and physical therapy copayment at 125% of the primary care copayment rounded up to the next $5 increment in compliance with current law but also conditionally approve a copay at 125% rounded down to the next $5 increment should the legislature modify the statute to require the copay to be under 125%. So that should cover us and 
current law and the contemplated change. Does that give you enough time, Dana? Basically gives you the discretion to go with whatever ends up being the current law. I think if, you know, the wheels will move forward for redesign and, and implementation of, of uh, plan benefits so that if it gets into May, June kind of time frame, it, it does become more operationally difficult to swap out that um, co-payment and the thought was that it's more likely that it will go through than it won't, um, which is where we landed with that proposal. But, uh, i got to get one of those crystal balls. I never know what's happening. Mike, are you comfortable with that? I am. I'd also be comfortable with the alternative of, of approving the plan and design, the co pays that they've recommended, and um, as long as it's consistent with state law, which would give them the discretion to, if the bill does not pass, to keep the co pays where they currently are, which is within the range. So I think either one of those works. Anybody have a preference? I, I'm happy. It might be simpler to do it, like I said. So maybe I'll withdraw yeah. and I'll withdraw and then. So um, I move we approve the pharmacy. Sorry, I move we approve the chiropractic and physical therapy co-payments uh, as presented, as long as state law permits uh, the, the, those co-pays to be under 125 percent of primary care copay for the 2021 plan here. Is there a second? Second. And again, we I guess by doing the two motions, we almost need to have two periods of public. But that's OK. Yeah. Um, would anyone from the public wish to make a statement at this time? Dale. Um, are you on the song? Yes. Yes. I, I'm going back and have her check these hearing aids. Um, my comment refers to the plans, because you made a motion, but I'm commenting on the plans. Is that OK? Um, so the bronze plan, well, let me start with this. I know four people that the last time the open enrollment came up, they went from silver to bronze. <clears throat> and the reason I found very striking, they were looking specifically at what the premium payment was, how that would calculate into how much they make a month, take that out, and how much did they have to live on. That was the decision. It was that simple. They needed to have a certain amount to live on. Four different people all had the same story with different circumstances, but it still had the same theme to it. There was no consideration whatsoever about what it really was going to cost to use a high deductible plan. And two of those people ended up using it. Thankfully, nothing major came up, but the $40 payment just to see the doctor sank them. That was more money than they had left out of a week's paycheck. Then you're talking the medicine on top of that. So I'm really concerned that what we're looking at in these plans and the way this is trended is the bronze plan is the plan of failure. It's how you make failure look good. Because the people that aren't making that much money are going to end up on plans like this that don't really deliver health care. Bad debt should go up because if they're struggling and picking the premium because that's all they can afford, we're losing somewhere. Even if it's not showing up in the hospitals, something's not getting paid because the plan was picked over an affordability issue. So going forward, I'm really, really worried. And it's not just in healthcare. I hear the same theme in daycare. 
can't afford the daycare for the children. I'm hearing this theme across the board. We have the universal health, uh, universal meals plan for children. We're talking about starvation. And yet we're also talking about health care with the same affordability issue here as well. Those same parents that are trying to figure out how to feed their kids are on the bronze plan. I don't know the solution. I'm just trying to point out these are things to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. I think maybe it's just easier if I make it now. That way, no one else is going to comment, <laughs> probably. Um, quick question for Dana, and is trying to understand what's exactly being measured with the um, engagement measures with the plan comparison tool. So it's page views. Is that page views of the? first page where you're entering in your household composition and if you wanted subsidies, or is it measuring page use of when that's completed and you click the button and you get the ranked list? Do you know? I, information that I received from the uh, analyst was too high level to really answer yeah. that. I think it's really just listed as page views and the, um, but the time on the page is also measured, and that was about the same last year and this year. So, um, you know, the, the whole purpose of that tool is to not just look at premium, but to get a lot of information about the uh, individual's you know, expected utilization. So, I think that's that's what's happening in the two minutes. And um, I just asked that because the online some web pages that click through to get to that list is really. You know, at least as I've used it, is is really where the meat and potatoes is. Is it doesn't really matter if you get to that first page where it's applicable household composition and um, you know your income if you want to look at PTC. But it's do you enter that and then click to get the list? And then even you know, I mean, looking at a game, I mean, you could probably track when you're at that list. You know, I'll sometimes go, oh, what does this plan do? And look at the plan design and that. So I think when we're looking at engagement on the, uh, the plan comparison tool, it's really about more than just do you hit that initial page, but we really should be interested in how folks are moving through the process and is that process easy to understand? Because I think you guys have a great, it's a great tool, and you know, focusing on how we can optimize movement within it to benefit the compute consumer would be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Anyone else? If not, uh, we'll vote on the motion. Was did the secretary agree to the revised motion? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Do you have a second motion, Robin? I do. Um, I move that we approve the plan design changes uh, as described on slide 18. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? I would just make a comment um, that I think every year this process is uh, technical and frustrating uh, because there are so many federal constraints around the actuarial value and really what we're doing here uh, is a very sort of technical review. Uh, I think quite frankly it was a more uh, meaningful review at the very beginning when the board was deciding things about uh, how much should be, uh, what what types of co-pays, for example, should be provided for the first dollar or no dollar and all those sorts of value-based plan design issues. Um, and to Dale's point, you know, I don't think any one of us are comfortable with the co-pay or the deductible levels for the bronze plans because they are high and people are spending a lot of money. Um, for a plan that's very difficult and expensive to use. So I just wanted to say that out loud. Um, but at the same time, we have a very technical role in this particular regulatory process. 
Um, and so I think we we have to live within our statutory parameters and responsibilities. Other discussion? Can I ask a clarifying question? So the changes on slide 18, not all of them require your approval. Um, the ones that do are specifically set out here and highlighted in green. So would the motion be to approve those changes requiring board approval under our policy? Or? I'm happy to to amend the motion to reflect that if that's if that's the preferred way to do it. Okay, with the seconder? Sure. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Dan. Thank you all very much. I'll say Brittany, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. At this time, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We've moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.